Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. My name is Bob Flax, I'm the Executive Director, and today is April the 8th, 2023. I'm joined by our book club production team of Gail Hughes, who's our club coordinator, and Drea Bergman, who's our programs and campaigns manager, and they're actually the people who do all the heavy lifting behind the scenes to make sure that this happens. I, I want to start off with a, a, an announcement of some sad news. Um, we have just learned moments ago uh, that Ben Ferenz, who's an icon in international law, uh, has passed away. Um, we believe he's 103 or 104 at, at this point. We don't have the ex exact date. Um, but as a young attorney, for those of you who don't know Ben, as a young attorney, uh, he was one of the prosecutors for the Nuremberg trials, um, the, you know, the Nazi war crimes trials, and has consistently contributed to international law, to the body of international law over the decades. We have volumes of his work at our office in DC. He's also been a big supporter of Citizens for Global Solutions. Um, he published, some of you may know of it, um, a copy of Planethood, um, one of the introductory books that have brought many people into the movement. And as I understand it, he had 30,000 extra copies. Um, Whoever is, um, if, if you're not on mute, please go on mute at this point, because I'm hearing background noise. Something's rattling. Um, so as I was saying, um, can everyone go on mute? I'm still hearing, and, and could my team help mute people who are not on mute? Okay. Um, so as I was saying, he, um, in addition to writing the book, um, he published about 30,000 extra copies, as I was told, uh, for CGS to give out to people. Uh, so he was a very personal supporter. Um, we gave him our Global Governance Award about three or four years ago. And uh, he was in his late 90s and perfectly lucid, charming, charismatic. I mean, it was, it was quite a, a sight to behold. So anyway, we will um, be disseminating more information, as I'm sure many organizations will be doing as we find out more. Uh, but I wanted to start with that announcement and pass that on. So a true, a true human treasure um, has left us on this plane. So, um, so moving on from there, um, we realized that we haven't been welcoming new people to the group. So we wanted to do that. So I don't know if there's anybody who has joined us newly, uh, not just only for today, but since we began this book, um, and today's our third session. So if there's anyone who has joined us since then, I just want to give them a chance to say hello, you know, say their name, where they are in the world, and a brief sentence on what brings them here. So um, there may not be anyone in that category at the moment, but if there is, I want to give you a chance to uh, say hello. Okay, I see a hand, John. Uh, yeah, I'm new to this group with this book. Uh, I am chair of the World Federalist Movement and I am working closely with Maya on a project on environmental governance. Uh, and I've long wanted to, to join the, the book club, but uh, found it difficult to justify the time. But since my co-conspirator's book is the subject here, I thought I, I would join. Great, well, welcome. And uh, Melissa. Hi, my name is Melissa Katolsky and I'm from Connecticut in the United States. And I have been part of the World Court for Human Rights Coalition with David. And he has been saying that it's a good idea for me to join. And we actually, because of the book that you're, co you're covering, we've been able to have an amazing success. And I'll let uh, David introduce that. But um, we did have a wonderful meeting last week. And it, it, um, it is a, in large part because of the book. Thank you so much. Terrific. And welcome. Anybody, any other newcomers to the group? Terrific. Okay, well then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. So as I said, today is our third session discussing the book, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. We'll be focusing today on the second half of part two, uh, which are chapters nine through 12 on reforming the central institutions of the United Nations. And we've, we've been up until now, we've been fortunate enough to have all three authors join us. Um, at the moment, my Graf is with us, who will be staying for the entire session. I understand there's a conference or something else happening, so the other two authors will be popping in and out. Um, uh, author Lion Dahl is with us right now, and I'm expecting Augusto Lopez Claros to be coming in. He emailed me. He's going to try to come in in about 15 minutes or so from now. 
It's been a wonderfully rich conversation, I must say. Uh, if you've missed any of the sessions, the recordings are available at our website. So we'll proceed as usual with the authors pointing out the highlights and main ideas from the chapters we're covering, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion. Uh, we ask everybody to remain on mute um, when you're not speaking or asking a question um, so that we minimize any background noise and dogs barking and children crying and all, all that good stuff. And, and there is someone right now I'm hearing who is off mute. So, um, and you're welcome to use the chat function to communicate with the group, but we will not be monitoring it. Uh, so if you have any questions you want to ask during the Q&A period, uh, we ask you to raise your cyber hand if you know how to do that. And I'll go through those first. And then you can raise your flesh and blood hand uh, if you don't know how to click the buttons for the cyber hand. We'll stop at about five minutes before the end of the session for any announcements that people may have about relevant things or events they're promoting or anything like that. So we ask you to hold those kind of announcements until the end. And uh, last bit of logistics is if people arrive that we don't know, we may stop and just ask them to identify themselves to prevent any kind of Zoom bombing or hacking or those other nasty things that happen in cyberspace. So having said all that, I will now turn it over to our authors. So whoever wants to start off. Well, perhaps I could start with the first of the chapters we're looking at on disarmament, <clears throat> since I can't stay too long uh, and the expertise of the other authors come with the later chapters. I might help you with this one first. And I think Terrific. it's certainly, it's probably the most difficult subject in the whole book. It's the area in which the UN has failed most completely in spite of all of its promises and you know everything that has been done you know the the you know the failures you know already started you know at the end of the 19th century the, you know the problem that people saw the need for disarmament they couldn't stop the first world war they couldn't stop the second world war and so you can see all through the UN charter the elements are there for a peace force for disarmament you know the requirements are there and they've always failed to be implemented so this is perhaps the most challenging of all the issues in trying to reform the UN system. And as the chapter makes clear, in part, it is because of the power of what you call the military industrial complex, the enormous weight that has gone into the arms industry and gone into profiting from war, links to the more autocratic leaders for whom the military and the military power is their way of grabbing power, holding on to power, you know, inflating their egos. It, it plays to all the negative sides of governance and that are often dominant. And you could you would see it, or you can see with Hitler and others, and you know, and even today, you know, how difficult it is, even in democratic countries, to resist the power and influence of that. And of course, that's really behind the you know the the, the members with the veto, the permanent members who were the, the victors of World War II, basically, with the long armaments and have always refused to accept any giving up of the special status that comes from having that military superiority, having often you know, the nuclear weapons as, as well. Uh, and, and, and that's been so much of a, of a desire to hold on to that, that every attempt to try to agree in any kind of intelligent way to avoid the disaster that comes from war and for preparations for war you have failed because that has been so difficult to resist. And I think the chapter, you've all had a chance to read it, but I think it gives a reasonably objective overview of how difficult it is to face that issue and how many of them have been made and how they all have failed so far. And we can see today, since the book was written, war has broken out again in Europe. And we're seeing again, you know, it's going in the wrong direction. And again, since the book was written, the enormous inflation of military budgets and, you know, building new generations of new nuclear weapons and increasing armaments all over the world and even countries that have been neutral before having to join military alliances. Uh, you know, everything is going in the wrong direction. And therefore, I think beyond what we've written this, we're seeing how, one, how difficult this is and how we may have to suffer from another period of World War II World War II before finally that system was but initially broken enough, perhaps, the next time around to go to effective disarmament and to actually bring peace in the world. I think that's the, the great challenge of our time is the one that revolves around this chapter. So that's an 
a brief introduction and maybe there's some comments from that of what you've read and other reflections on that. And then go back to the, the issues of law and finances or the other elements, other chapters later on by the experts on the other authors here who when they can join us can share more of those. But I thought we'd get us started with this, perhaps you know, the, one of the key issues in the whole book that doesn't have any easy solution. Thank you. Can I, Thank you, I Arthur. Give... Yeah, Maya? Yeah, should I, Maya, should I give supplementary thoughts on this design sure, image sure, chapter sure. That, that Arthur and I co-authored? Um, uh, and then we can maybe discuss that chapter and then we can move on to rule of law and Arthur can go and have dinner. <laughs> and also just to say, it would be helpful if I could leave like on the hour or just pass so I could also get some dinner. I'm, I'm off site at the moment. So, and yeah, it's, it's a limited window. We're not in the habit yeah. of starving our authors. Bless so you, thank you so support. much. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, um, I think um, uh, I agree that this is a very challenging issue, of course, from the international for the international community. And you know, since 1899, disarmament featured prominently on the the first you know Hague Peace Conference <laughs> agenda. And so there's there's been you know very very uneven uh, steps forward. Although I would I would be a bit more um, positive in terms of the acquired expertise and knowledge we, we have developed on disarmament um, techniques and approaches um, and, and learning through various treaties. But this, this, the, the, you know, the, the dimensions of, of our current quote unquote disarmament and arms control system, if you can call it a system, I don't think it is a, a true system, <laughs> is you know, the fragmentation among you know, disparate various treaties, uh, usually done on, a, on an ad hoc basis. It has organically grown up in a, these sort of efforts in a very reactive way, um, you know. And and as we discussed last time, you know, these bilateral treaties between the U.S. and and Russia, for example, only after humanity has been pushed, you know, to the edge of the abyss in terms of uh, the nuclear weapons threat, and then are very fragile, backsliding. So um, it's 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 a it's sort of a very blocked, um, fragmented, weak governance sort of architecture, uh, proto-architecture -architect um, that, that is not serving humanity. And we know, you know, I just checked out the, the most recent uh, figures from CIPRI about global military spending estimates. And as of 2021, the, the latest figures I could look at is 2.1 trillion uh, in 2021, and that was another increase. So huge uh, expenditures on an area that economists have said um, is, you know, it's not a productive area of economic investment. It doesn't multiply through the economy. It's it's one of the you know least um, productive <laughs> areas to invest in, economically speaking. Also, also in terms of, you know, there's the economic issues. There's also, um, of course, the risks you run then if you have you know very large accumulations of, of weapons. In various uh, jurisdictions, various nations, regions, um, and all these also these these very difficult cycles of, of of arms races and security dilemmas, where you know countries have a difficult time understanding if if weapons uh, uh, armament uh, is 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 defensive or offensive in nature, um, and so there can be some vicious, very vicious circles, which which are extremely dangerous. And of course, we see those dynamics uh, today. I would say this disarmament arms control area is very much interdependent with other areas uh, that we've covered in our book. For example, you need very strong peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, which is subject of the next chapter, in order to have a proper um, disarm systemic disarmament plan. You also need a proper, properly endowed collective security mechanism, which countries can really rely on. Um, if you're going to have, you know, the 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 type of disarmament that we would envision as 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 you know healthy economically, socially, culturally that we need as a as a, a planetary community, and so the approach, you know, we took in the book, we kind of went through the various efforts so far, and indeed there has been a lot of knowledge and learning that we've now accumulated. There's there's disarmament arms control expertise, which is is quite well developed. Um, but there's a lack of visit, vision and, of course, political will, so-called, and, and real effort to, to put in place a serious, uh, serious systems um, and, and 
you know, a, a, a coordinated international sort of plan, which was envisioned in uh, the charter. So just there's, you know, Article 11 from General Assembly uh, can, can speak to these disarmament matters and has made plenty of, of actually very progressive statements um, and other efforts. But the article that we focus on quite a lot in the book is Article 26 about the Security Council responsibility. And I'll just read it to you. In order to promote the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security with the least diversion for armaments of the world's human and economic resources, the Security Council shall be responsible for formulating, with the assistance of the Military Staff Committee, plans to be submitted to the members of the UN for the establishment, for the establishment of a system for the regulation of armaments. Okay, they were tasked with drafting uh, a plan uh, uh, for systemic international arms, arms control, um, again, with this economic dimension. So, so there's this huge diversion of resources and this plan was never drafted, let alone submitted <laughs> to the international community. So, um, you know, in our book, we're like, we need to go back to this vision, this article of having a very serious systemic plan that has proper checks and balances, monitoring, verification, trust building measures, um, and uh, uh, that really would be this, this uh, vision and international system. So I'll stop there on that chapter. Great, thank you. So we'll divert, divert from, or depart, I should say, from our usual format while author's still with us and open it up to questions just about this chapter on disarmament. If there are any questions or comments, again, please raise your cyber hand if you have a question or comment, and then I'll take the flesh and blood hands after. So anything on this chapter? And I'll raise my hand if no one else is, okay. I'll start. Um, so given that it looks like, um, uh, certain powers in the world, I mean, certain countries are less interested as they get stronger or want to get stronger, less interested in becoming part of the kind of US led post World War II global order um, and are looking to break out of that. Um, it looks like the hope for disarmament, at least in the short run, um, might be getting worse. Um, so my, my question is, in terms of strategy, I mean, what does one do in the current political environment to, um, to bring groups to the table that seem less interested in participating uh, in what has been set up over the last few decades? So just to any of the authors who want to speak to that. Do we take... Uh, the three questions on this chapter, maybe, and then oh, okay. respond. Fa or what fa do you think? Fabulous. Whatever fabulous. you wish. Yeah. Yeah. More more efficient. Okay. So I got Joseph and then Gail. Go ahead, Joseph. <clears throat> well, uh, one of the um, most significant um, initiatives toward disarmament was taken. Um, by Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, and this brings up the issue of uh, international leadership. And Gorbachev is my example. He, um, he proposed uh, something completely unimaginable, a unilateral cut in arms as a uh, invitation to others to follow his examples. And he proposed the inter Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and he proposed the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. And this included a reduction of the Red Army in Europe of 500,000 troops. I think what is missing uh, in your book is some kind of uh, imagining of a new kind of international leadership like that of Gorbachev or before him of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill in the Atlantic Charter. That goes way back, but they uh, held up disarmament as a fundamental policy goal for the Western allies, uh, followed by later by the Soviets. So what can you tell us about 
moving international leaders okay. toward disarmament. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Gail, you're up next. You got to go off mute. Um, yeah, it seems to me that the good news is, you know, when you say that um, there seems to be um, an increasing norm that it's anachronistic and unnecessary to have war, like internationally, that seems to be a growing norm. But the problem, a problem is that, I mean, arms manufacture is one incentive to, um, you know, to have arms, but also, um, as you pointed out, there are benefits of having an enemy, particularly as um, an election approaches. Um, a leader that is up for, re who is up for re-election, um, if, if he's involved in a war, you know, has um, more likelihood that he'll win. I'm wondering what, um, how can we decrease the benefits of having an enemy and the benefits of war and armaments? Right, thank you, Gail. Any other questions or comments for our authors? Okay, seeing and hearing none, um, floor is open. Each, whichever of you wants to respond first. Well, maybe with a response to the question about the benefits, can we have alternative kinds of enemies than ones that require armaments? You know, can we see climate change as an enemy threatening our very security and survival? Can we mobilize people and industries to you know, see the, the investment in what they can do to fight climate change and to make a rapid transition to you know, renewable, you know, renewable energy sources and so on? Maybe we need to find what was that motivation to have a you know, is it something useful and say, are there more constructive forms of, of confrontation, so to speak, that aren't, don't involve among human beings, but maybe against some of the other things that are very threatening us today. And there are a wider set of threatens that we can look at. And in, in the same way, with respect to you know, leadership, of course, it takes enormous courage to go against the powers that be in your own country. Now, I don't know enough about the motivation behind Gorbachev, but clearly there was such an excess investment that he could afford to make a significant reduction without going below what was, what was necessary to defend essential interests. There was a lot of waste there that could be saved, so to speak, in terms of the economy by cutting back. Now, whether there are other similar economies that could be done as a first step with, you know, the, you know, because that may have, it's a progressive thing. You, know, you have to build trust. You have to have alternatives to in conflict resolution. You have to have all the other things in place so that governments will finally give up the investment in the military and arms and the threat of war and the need to go to war. But that, so that it, it's not just in a narrow sense addressing the arms by themselves, it's addressing the whole framework of you know, relationship between nations and of trust that has to be strong enough in foundation for alternatives that they're willing to let go and have the courage to let go. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the pressures to continue the old things you know, are still there. It's not a perfect answer, but I think that's one of the elements of, uh, and of course, the, the, the other question is who can move now? We've already seen the most recent advances in disarmament been done by civil society. The new treaties didn't come within governments originally, they came within civil society and, and they still don't have the major powers involved, but they have been steps forward in defining international law from elements of disarmament. So I think again there, there's plenty of room for other actors than the dominant powers to make steps forward and build mechanisms that ultimately could then be accepted by everybody as a, a, a solid something to build on to build effective disarmament in the future. Thank you. Maybe perhaps Maya can add some things now. Yeah, uh, a couple of additional comments um, in terms of the hope for disarmament and um, uh, Bob, you mentioned uh, less interest in the US, less post World War II uh, order. But I mean, there's obviously been disillusionment the whole time with this quote unquote US led order. <laughs> and has it, I mean, um, so, so. I mean, I think there needs to be new narratives about us as a global community and what we want to achieve as a global community and, you know, beyond these 
uh, very ugly and I would say very outdated, you know, kind of uh, uh, superpower kind of uh, politics and aspirations. I mean, it's, it's kind of, a, it's, it's an immature in terms of, you know, um, um, political discourses and practicalities. We want a rules-based, you know, justice-based international system where the well-being of all is is taken into consideration. So, I think um, you know the strategy, as Arthur was saying, there have been really tremendous uh, achievements by global civil society who have navigated around very skillfully and adeptly in very difficult ge geopolitical circumstances. You know the the major quote unquote major powers with the landmines treaty, with the nuclear weapons ban treaty in 2017, very recent dramatic successes. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, binding international law and, and norm setting, I mean, under the current conditions of <laughs> international law, which, as you know, uh, I feel need to be greatly improved. Um, and 122 states adopted uh, the nuclear weapons uh, ban treaty, um, 122, so over half of uh, UN membership. So you see the, the vast majority of, of states, um, they, they, they're not... They have no interest in having um, a, a world threatened by by nuclear weapons or, you know, by these military economic interests. So this can be leveraged in the international system. But then, who has the vision to push forward for the next generation of, of disarmament efforts and uh, architecture? Right. It's uh, 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 one of the disarmament experts we were in dialogue with recently. She was saying, "Oh, we need like like a like a youth like a youth." climate movement for disarmament and arms control. But of course, we don't see that really um, um, arising at this moment. And in terms of the leadership, I agree very much, uh, Joseph, about uh, that leadership is so important and also, and also kind of an articulation of what we expect in leaders and, and this, this, this um, uh, articulating this, this wish and sort of communicating this wish to have the kind of visionary, uh, transformative leadership at the international level. I don't know how we push that or catalyze that uh, more. There's some heads of state now who are trying to be those visionary leaders, but you know, likely aren't at this moment. Um, but one thing we've noticed in the Climate Governance Commission, you know, the former heads of state who are involved in it and the elders, they've, they've noticed uh, that uh, they've been looked to a lot because of this, this lack of vision, this, la this leadership void at the international level with these really you know, bold visionary steps forward. So there, there's, there's really a felt gap in, in that respect without a, without a doubt, 100%. Um, and then, yeah, one thing that might catalyze changes in our, our military weapons spending uh, arms is, is the, the the financial resources that are going to military still and we need we need trillions a year for climate finance you know and for mitigation adaptation um so that could be a hook to get some momentum and then lastly um gail um right the the demon like the demonization of the enemy abroad um, it's yeah, and it, it's very psychological, obviously, <laughs> within it, within a nation. It's culturally contexted, um, and there just have to be you know other narratives. I, I agree with Arthur, like the, the climate change, and I've talked to like architects of the Paris Agreement um, that this security dimension of climate could be like a unifying kind of. It has to be mobilized, you know, responsibly um, um, and wisely. But I think. Um, you know, there has to be there has to be real efforts at international education, and we have a chapter on that. Um, but also, you know, through the through mass media, in terms of just educating people also on the promise of the charter and also the benefits of a quote unquote peace system. But again, there isn't like a strong social movement at the moment that could you know push this forward or really accelerate the outreach and learning about you know the key provisions of the charter, the intentions, what benefits we get from getting, truly getting this peace div dividend with peaceful, peaceful settlement of disputes uh, and collective security, et cetera. So at this moment, I don't, like there doesn't seem to, there isn't a global movement, but doesn't mean there, there can't be at, at any particular time. And maybe with the changes with, with the climate, planetary, ecological crises might 
you know, dovetail and have to be connected. Great, thank you, Maya. Um, I see David's hand up. Are there any other questions or comments in addition to David's about this chapter? So put your hand up now and we'll, we'll take you if, if you arrive. So David, go right ahead. Um, can you imagine a world without nuclear weapons, without ridding the world of war? It seems that the reason why we have nuclear weapons or any kind of war weapons is because of the war system. So um, your comments. Well, I think we can be we can be hopeful that in one sense, the existence of the weapons has made you know, the concept of full-scale war untenable. You know, it's suicide. And therefore, whereas war with, with conventional weapons, one could imagine surviving or getting around or so on and so forth, you know, that the idea of a massive nuclear exchange would be the you know, suicide of most of the human race. And hopefully, you know, there's something that would slam on brakes for many people, you know, before that last step is taken. So it's in fact, the nature of war has been transformed by the existence of those weapons, which may actually make it easier to move towards full scale disarmament. If we say that war is now untenable as a concept, whether it be with conventional weapons or nuclear weapons, we, you go back to the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and you know, one you know, officer on a submarine who wasn't ready to push the button to you know, launch a weapon at a you know at a at a Russian ship you know, in his sights you know one feeling of, of humanity resisting the, the temptation to do the, the 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 obvious thing as a military person to do so you know, there was a bit of humanity that saved us then maybe we can be a little more intelligent now by saying this has become so much more threatening you know whether we'll finally take some limited use of technical weapons to finally push us to that point and I don't know. You know, I've seen studies ways that uh, who will survive a nuclear holocaust? And they say, well, if you live in the Vanuatu or the Solomon Islands, you know, someplace in the Southern Hemisphere that can feed itself for a few years, maybe there'll be a few survivors, but that's basically it. So I think we just, you know, it's not a perfect answer, but I think let's, let's be hopeful that those, the fact that they exist means that maybe we can go all the way towards the disarmament today. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Arthur. So seeing no other hands, um, I'll then, return it to our presentations uh, about this, these chapters in the book. So, and author, thank you for being here as long as you can be and enjoy your dinner. <laughs> uh, you're on mute, author, you're on mute. Oh, okay, I guess he was okay. saying goodbye. <laughs> he was probably yeah. saying goodbye. Yeah. Okay, I'll just give some framing thoughts then on chapter 10 and chapter 11 on strengthening the international rule of law and on the international human rights architecture. So chapter 10, firstly, you know, there's a long history of, of this theory um, that, you know, a durable, sustainable international peace is only possible if we have uh, a proper international legal system um, that we replace law, peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, uh, replace war with, with these mechanisms um, as we embrace at the national level, of course. <laughs> um, and it's been considered you know, for a very long time, however, quite futuristic to have um, a functioning international, truly international legal system. It, 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 in some ways, you know, looking at different times in, in history where there have been, you know, public intellectuals really engaged with these concepts. Um, uh, for example, there's there's five U.S. presidents previously that supported some version of, you know, global peace through through law uh, kind of theories. Um, but intellectually, this is not necessarily, you know, sort of a governing. Uh, concept that you know in my field of international law, international lawyers are really uh, talking about and working you know to push forward our inter our core you know basic international legal architecture. So I, th I think that's very interesting to look back um, in the intellectual history of different times and and places. Um, and you know uh, the the you know, the big pushes for that has led us towards what is now modern inter contemporary international law 
can be traced back perhaps to you know, 1899 and 1907 with the two first Hague Peace Conferences, the adoption and the creation of the permanent court, court of arbitration in 1899, where it was, it was a transnational civil society movement um, that helped to catalyze this proposal for a permanent court of arbitration uh, to be available to all states that would replace warfare as a, as a means to, you know, resolve types of disputes to, uh, uh, of, of various various sorts. Um, so, so that, of course, then then did not prevent, and those disarmament efforts at, at those conferences did not prevent World War One, of course. Um, and World War I with uh, the, the, the League of Nations, then we had the Permanent Court of International Court of Just, uh, International Justice that was created, which then with the, the adoption of the Charter, 1945 led to the International Court of Justice being, being created uh, for disputes between states as a permanent court that supplements the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So states now have <laughs> a whole range of options uh, to peacefully uh, settle their disputes through third party neutral uh, judicial or arbitrator um, uh, processes, arbitration processes. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so basically where are we at now um, and what are we proposing in, in the book? Um, basically, I, I kind of put together uh, an international rule of law improvement package. You know, the, the charter hasn't been um, amended and the, the statute for the International Court of Justice is annexed to the charter. Uh, so this has been now 78 years where we have, for example, the International Court of Justice was the principal uh, legal body of, of, of the UN system, uh, which has not been reformed uh, in all of these decades, years, um, despite being having a very steady caseload and increasing increasing caseload, even though it doesn't have compulsory jurisdiction, um, states have taken so many cases there and, and from every region of the world. So it shows shows really the trust in in these sort of institutional mechanisms um, and the need for them, of course. Um, uh, so. Uh, what we proposed in the book, firstly, would be an ICJ modernization. Um, other more contemporary, or more recent international courts have outpaced ICJ in procedural sophistication, for example, um, and even making just having a very small targeted uh, amendment to the charter, making the ICJ compulsory as a dispute settlement venue for questions of international law. Uh, would be an unbelievably positive step forward for the international community, uh, together with the the international criminal court, uh, which uh, could similarly have uh, uh, compulsory jurisdiction for UN members. Both of those jurisdictions could be tied to UN membership, uh, which is you know as as basic kind of principles um, and basic criteria for being a member of. Uh, international society, the international community, also uh, proposed uh, an upgrade of chapter six of the charter on peaceful settlement of disputes, which is uh, a chapter which has been under looked, underutilized, not sort of celebrated, promoted, uh, elaborated, um, um, and really sort of robustly embraced by Many many factions of, of our sort of international community, including civil society, often um, um, has not pushed uh, for the for the usage of, of Chapter Six on peaceful settlement of disputes, which sets out all the various options that are available to states for their obligation to peacefully settle disputes. Um, so uh, we propose also, you know, an upgrade to make more mandatory and sort of step stepwise sort of uh, uh, procedural mechanisms to to in, ensure that states follow peaceful dispute uh, <laughs> mechanisms for any relevant uh, issues. Uh, also, we support um, an international judicial academy uh, as an important uh, feature to to ensure that there's uh, judicial prof uh, professionals with requisite 
knowledge, skill, training to then staff uh, these new, newly endowed international legal institutions. This has been, you know, a problem at the international level. Judges at the national level are not usually well trained in international law, even in law schools. International legal programs still are, you know, very optional, not uh, as strong as as they need to be. So, yeah. So this rule of law package, um, again, you know, similar to the disarmament area, um, there's there's some very reasonable, you know, powerful next steps forward to progress this area for for stronger more humane um, and, and prosperous international governance. Um, but there isn't an, an advocacy community. There's no smart coalition of civil society like United States to, for example, reform the ICJ, even though this has been recommended by some law societies. Um, <clears throat> but if this were to be you know, put forward, this would increase the international community's governance capacity across a whole range of areas. Uh, to be to have uh, enforceable international treaties at the International Court of Justice, it could be um, also enabled to have more individual sort of petitions that could be considered. Um, and yeah, lastly, just to, to make a note that um, I think it's in this chapter where I quote the anthropologist Douglas Fry uh, and his cross-cultural research he's done on the the key attributes to have a sustainable peace system. And one of those is, you know, effective supranational institutions for dispute resolution, which we have, you know, we have a start. We have um, a beta version or beta plus um, of, of these dispute resolution um, bodies, but they 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 just have not progressed to be truly the type of legal institutions that we take for granted at the national level with proper. Uh, enforcement uh, and and enforcement supervision um, and compulsory, uh, you know, having this also compulsory uh, uh, attribute, which is basically a core core quality. If you want a rule of law system, is that the law applies to everybody and is impartially uh, applied to all actors. Um, so that's it. Um, I'll stop there in a nutshell. And did you want me to do the short? Thomas on chapter 11 at the same yeah. time? Well, or, let, yeah. let, let, let me briefly um, welcome our third author um, who just joined this, Augusto Lopez Claros. And just, uh, Augusto, let me fill you in on what's happened so far so you know where we are in the discussion. Um, author was with us briefly. So, um, so we discussed the chapter on disarmament and took questions on that. And now Maya was going into the rest of the book. Um, so that's kind of where we are at the moment. And, and my, you know, e either way you want to do yeah. it. Um, what I could, yeah, what yeah. I can do is I'll give just brief comments on chapter 11 on, on, on human rights, and then we can have discussion. And then Augusto can um, talk about the funding um, mechanism, the new funding mechanism, which is uh, very important. And okay. also we could break it up that way. Yeah. Functional governance. Yeah, so um, just quickly for chapter 11, um, you know, th there have been on, on the international human rights architecture. So there have been, of course, steps forward with the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights in 1948, and then the two covenants on human rights that kind of broke up the Universal Declaration into two, you know, they're, they're supposed to be binding treaties on human rights and social, economic, cultural rights, and then civil, political. Um, which are which are now very widely ratified, and then a whole body corpus of many different international human rights treaties and conventions, which again are very widely ratified. And we see processes under you know Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, Convention on, on Elimination Discrimination Discrimination Against Women, where a lot of the reservations uh, to those treaties have been you know uh, withdrawn. So there's 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 quite an incredible consensus and growing you know, body of, 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 of human rights obligations at the international level. There was a, a shift to, from the Human Rights Commission to Council in 2005, 2006, um, which introduced some <laughs> um, relatively positive steps forward. But now our argument to the book is, OK, We've made some progr progress, but again, in terms of having a fair, impartial, neutral, non-politicized international system based on, you know, again, garden variety legal principles, we still have 
uh, a long ways to go in terms of international human rights and you know the hypocrisy of members of the Human Rights Council, for example, uh, is, is highlighted not infrequently. Um, and there's, we you know, suggest what could be the next uh, generation, the next step forward for reforming the Human Rights Council further, for consolidating the, the treaty, different treaty bodies and the fragmented system um, of, of human rights treaties and uh, universal periodic review, also the funding of human rights. It's supposed to be one of the, the key pillars of the UN system, but only receives 3% of, of, of funding. So very badly underfunded. And then, you know, we're also supporting the proposals for an international human rights uh, tribunal or court, which, uh, I mean, I don't go into design features in, in, in specificity in the chapter, because I think there has to be really careful consideration of what could work at the international level with deference to some regional systems. Um, and also, I think there has to be more dialogue on the cultural approaches and more, um, you know, real engagement with various regions, which now, for example, East Asian region and Asia in general has, has moved, really moved forward human rights, but still there has to be, you know, a real dialogue to make sure it's not just, you know, Western imperialism, um, that there's, there's a really a meeting of the minds. Indeed, as there was, they tried to uh, make sure happen with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights across very diverse cultures. So I'll leave it there and uh, so we can discuss. Okay, and, and before I call for any questions on chapters 10 and 11, um, Augusto, is there anything that you wanted to add on those two chapters? Um, no, Bob. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Maya. I'm sure uh, Aldoy has just joined. You know, has done an excellent okay. job of, of covering the issues. So, when you are ready to go to funding and finances, right. I'm happy to come in, but not yeah. at this point. Terrific. No, 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 no problem. So, yeah. So, in that case, um, any questions or comments regarding those two chapters? And um, I'll give a chance for other people to raise their hands so we can hear them all at once. We could take a second round if new questions came up. Okay, so um, David, why don't you go first, then Gail? Sure, thanks, Bob. So uh, on two, page 259, and you did just mention, um, Maya, the establishment of a World Court of Human Rights, and you referred to the, uh, the Swiss um, government trying to get that process going. Um, so I can tell you that uh, Melissa Kotelski and I are, have been uh, working, convening a coalition for a World Court of Human Rights, working with several other people and attorneys uh, around the world to make that happen. And I'm, uh, I'm well, and we've been promoting specifically this statute for the World Court of Human Rights, which we call the Treaty of Lucknow. And I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but the website for that is uh, worldcourtofhumanrights.net. But the exciting thing is that because of your book, uh, about a week ago, uh, Melissa was able to bring in um, um, uh, Manfred Nowak and Martin Scheinin into one of our coalition meetings. And the exciting thing that they said is that uh, their version of a World Court of Human Rights and our version both have merits uh, to them. Uh, and we compared them and we'll be meeting again. In fact, this week, uh, the Washington Working Group on the International Criminal Court will be having us present uh, the, these, the two statutes and the coalition to try to build the coalition. So I guess my question would be, uh, where do you think we should go first to really expand this uh, coalition for a World Court of Human Rights? And, 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 and maybe if I'm bold enough to say, uh, how would you uh, and Augusto perhaps want to help us to, to do that? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's get the questions from Gail and Lee as well. Go ahead, Gail. Oh. Uh you you were off mute for okay yeah now you're back <laughs> okay um yeah I noticed noted that I mean something very encouraging to me is that when you said that um, war increasingly does not work um, and I'm thinking if war doesn't work then the incentive for countries going to war is, is less and maybe war would just you know kind of fizzle out even though there are a lot of, as we just mentioned with the last chapter, there are incentives for war. Um, anyway, that struck me as a really encouraging sign. 
And along with that, also um, violent um, resistance has been, um, I think, increasingly changed to passive resistance, you know, from the time of, of Gandhi. So maybe, um, maybe violence will be, you know, is, is on a down a downturn. But I'm wondering if um, control through war might be replaced by um, subversion and, um, well, in, in passive resistance on the other hand, subversions such as mind control, propaganda, censorship, and so on to control people. Is there any attention to um, that form of danger of oppression? It's a different form of oppression um, as opposed to war. And I was wondering if there's been any attention to that. Thank you, Gail. Lee? In chapter 10, I was struck by the comment or the statement that we have a need for an international cultural shift. And immediately my brain went, cultural shift? What can we do about the Taliban? And I, I wouldn't even have any idea in the world how to begin to have a cultural shift in, with the Taliban. We're so, so, so far apart. And then, then that, within that paragraph or that section, it discussed education as becoming the, of supreme importance. Well, in, in that country, there is no education now for women and girls. And so what steps can we take? Are there any steps we can take to try to get a cultural shift going there? Great, thank you, Lee. And seeing no other hands, I'll turn it over to our authors. Great, yeah, firstly, um, David, thanks so much for letting me know about this, this um, very productive meeting you, you recently had on a different human right court design features and proposals. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And when I was writing the chapter, that was really what I felt needed to happen. <laughs> it's like, you know, different, different uh, um, prototypes should be looked at and, and really thoughtful international discussions with, you know, practitioners in various countries really in touch with the local conditions. Um, and, and then, then to figure out also, you know, those who are specializing and, and, and have really looked into, okay, what could be a viable international design based on the European Court of Human Rights, based on uh, regional mechanism, other regional mechanisms. Um, so, so that sounds really, really, really positive and, and could also, yeah, really develop into a, a powerful proposal, again, if it's really um, connected um with uh, with also local conditions um because yeah in my view international law should be mature enough and our tribunal human rights tribunal experience should be mature enough that we can we can do something meaningful at the international level so just in terms of where to go first to expand <laughs> or like to build a campaign i'm happy to have like a, a chat with with you and colleagues um, um, uh, you know, to hear what you've been up to, what kind of support you have at this moment, um, what kind of design features you're looking at, um, and also, yeah, and just to share, for example, our experience recently with this campaign for an international anti-corruption court, which has been very uh, educational um, in many, many ways. So happy to have that discussion, you know, more in depth at another time. Um, the organizers have my email. Yeah, and. Um, War does the, the comments about war does not work. Yes, it's it's wonderful. Like you know, Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, you know, looking at statistics across centuries, basically uh, that violence is decreasing. And um, even though you know, I complain that the normative force of the charter still hasn't been internalized, <laughs> but the charter is a is is an absolutely incredible instrument. And also education provisions that states must obligations to educate their populations are, are through so many key major human rights treaties or statements, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights, SDGs, Human Rights Conventions, 
um, so and, and including on education, on no, non-warring values, culture of peace, human rights. So, so there's there's still a ton of education that we have to do, and like a like an articulation of our core international values. And so we have two chapters later that we'll talk about on education for transformation and values and principles. Um, but we still we do see see this gradual gelling of an international society where war does shock the conscience of you know, most populations around the world now. And the response with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine immediately to international law now, and, and even like a decade ago, that, that probably would have been different or a decade, decade and a half ago. Um, and, and just a note that um, the charter outlawed war. I, I don't think many people uh, know that, again, general population, the only time war is mentioned is in the preamble of the charter to say it's a scourge a scourge which we have to avoid. And then the rest of the charter language is, is about, you know, clinical sort of technical language about a collective security uh, system uh, where breach threats to peace um, uh, have to be addressed by the bodies that have been designated under the charter. Um, so obviously those bodies have not behaved, you know, in the way that they were intended in a, in a truly responsible way to the international community. But Anyways, just to say, I think there, there's there's an incredible amount of hope for <laughs> making more progress. Um, uh, also based on you know a shared sense of international identity, which was one of the points in Douglas Fry, the anthropologist's book uh, or articles about you know attributes of a peace system. And just think of like Yuval Harari's recent book on sapiens, on the unity of the human race. Uh, it was a huge bestseller across like massively diverse countries so there's there's yeah there's enormous potential and the need yeah the need for a cultural shift um you know i don't have any quick fixes for the situation in and in, in afghanistan unfortunately um but i have seen you know very profound transformations for example in in india where there's been um very um very rigid very harmful and abusive caste systems uh, and, and, and very systematic exclusion of, of women. Um, there have been transformations of, of society based on like a spiritual or values-based education, which is based on inclusion, consultation. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there, there are processes and methods and, and with the Taliban, I don't know how um, foreign they really are in the sense that you know, it's a continuum, the, the, the level to which, you know, historically there has been this um, gender prejudice uh, or prejudice against women. This is, we, we find this in, in virtually every society. And yes, it's, it's extreme and it, it does, again, really shock our conscience now, which is, is, is good that it shocks our conscience very deeply and that we expect every woman around the world, every girl around the world to have access to education, to be safe, et cetera. Um, but I, I think there, in terms of the cultural outreach to, for example, the Taliban, I mean, there's, there, there are options with, without a doubt. And again, it's, there, there are many techniques that, that we, have, we have used in Western societies to, to force changes in the society or to encourage and cajole changes in terms of thinking about women and including them. So yeah, any, anyways, no, no quick fixes, but um, I think, yeah, in, indeed, we need a cultural shift you know, how the whole of Af Afghanistan was dealt with over many years by the international community was, it, of course, so many things could have been done differently and, and so much more in such a more constructive way. So that's sort of a separate conversation. But I do see the need for the international cultural shift, the, the sort of unity of, of sort of goals, purpose, values, which I see gelling. Um, um, but we also have to internalize human rights in our, you know, in our everyday communities, but in, in all of our, our pursuits. But anyways, that's a longer conversation. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And I know you said you need to leave at the end of the hour. So if you meant now, I want to thank you for, for being here with us today and look forward to next time. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. <laughs> okay. And um, so for, the, for our final chapter, let me turn to Augusto and um, take it away. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, 
It's a, a pleasure to be with you. I, I apologize for a, a little bit the uncertainty of whether I would be able to join or not. I am in Chile at the moment, and um, I, I, I have a, a number of engagements throughout the day, but I was able to carve out uh, this this period and and to join this this conversation. You know, in the book, we we felt very strongly that it was important to address sort of the, the issue of funding, um, uh, both to the UN system on the one hand, and more broadly, um, you know, how does one generate uh, funding for, you know, a whole range of initiatives which are intimately linked to, to the future of humanity and to our ability to resolve some of the, you know, pressing problems that, that, that we have. Um, you know, the, the, this UN system has a, a, a form of funding that is uh, um, very inefficient. Uh, uh, it has uh, some, some habits, some, some traditions, some procedures, you know, that have been uh, in operation already for several decades. And that unfortunately create a great deal of uncertainty for the, for the United Nations uh, when it comes to funding its operations and also do not generate you know, resources which are adequate to the challenges that we face and to the expectations that we have of the UN system you know, to do the things that, that it, should, it should do, especially given the ambition, uh, the, the ambition of the UN Charter uh, and its emphasis on peace and security. Um, the UN um, uh, member, members, 193 of them, um, basically have a, a, what is called uh, assessed contributions. There are some formulas that have evolved over time, some, some criteria which determine the percent of the UN budget which is, going to, which is going to be allocated to each of the members. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, as, as of the latest data, the United States continues to be uh, the largest contributor to the UN budget. They account for 22% of the, of the budget. And then the second largest contributor um, is now China. Um, their contribution, their assessed contribution has been rising very, very rapidly. You know, back in 2000, which is only, uh, you know, two decades ago, China would contribute less than 1% to the UN budget. Today, it's the second largest contributor at, at 15%, 15 plus a little something. And then comes Japan, and then comes Germany afterwards. These contributions are very asymmetric. Um, uh, the last time I looked at the numbers, the 10 uh, uh, top countries, I think, contribute something like 70% of the UN budget. Uh, the top 20 countries contribute something like 85% of the UN budget. So it's, you know, the burden is, is very, very unevenly distributed. And uh, something else that has happened in recent decades is that um, a separate source of funding to that of the assessed contributions has emerged which are called earmarked contributions, right? So for instance, to give you an example, Sweden, maybe Sweden contributes, uh, let's say one and a half percent of the assessed contributions of the UN budget, the regular budget, but Sweden has its own pet projects. It has, uh, it wants to support family planning in Africa. It wants to support climate change mitigation in, in uh, India and so on. And so they contribute directly to the UN budget uh, and it's called earmark because it is directed to particular projects and particular purposes which have to be aligned with the wishes and the preferences and priorities of Sweden. And of course, you know, because this is money for development, it's welcome, the UN budget, the, the UN is happy to intermediate its resources. But what has happened is that earmark contributions have grown remarkably in, in, in the last, let's say, 20 years, and now are the most important component of the UN budget. They are much larger than the assessed contributions, which are an obligation of membership of UN, UN members, right? And so some people are not very happy with this, uh, with this uh, mechanism, with this, with this uh, sort of practice, 
because what it has essentially led to is a remarkable increase in the leverage and the power of the rich countries, which are the ones that have these earmark contributions. You know, it's not the Indias and the Bangladesh and the Paraguays of this world that uh, contribute to the earmark budget. It is the big countries, the, 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 the donors, you know, Japan, the United States, Germany, and, and so on. And so this has led to an increase in the influence of the wealthy countries uh, through this mechanism of earmark contributions. And some people don't like that because it goes a little bit against the notion of multilateralism, against the notion that, you know, this is our United Nations, all of us contribute in some way. And uh, and we you know we uh, we are not going to use the UN as a mechanism to promote national priorities, right? But th that is the reality. And because money is scarce, because there is a lot of need in the world, you know, there is illiteracy, there is malnutrition, there is poverty, there is inequality, and many of these projects, especially if we talk about the Swedes and the Norwegians and, and others, you know, they 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 are trying to create some good for the world but reflecting the priorities of, of, of the donors, right? In the book, we, what we, we say is, look, we need to sort of add a degree of rationality to, this, to, the, to, the, to the way that the UN funds itself. And so we have various, various ideas, and I, I want to share with them, you know, sort of two or three of them or four of them, which I think are at the very center of our proposals. The first one is the following, we say, Let's do away with the system that is non-transparent. It's full of carve-outs and formulas and floors and ceilings and sort of bilateral negotiations, which are subject to, to essentially abuse and coercion sometimes by member countries. Uh, you know, there are many examples of countries making their contributions, their, their assessed contributions, which are on obligation of membership, conditional on the UN doing X or Y, or you know, doing some kind of internal reform or, or putting some national from some important country in some important position. And so the budget becomes a mechanism for you know, sort of uh, horse trading and, and, and coercion. What we're saying is no, let's clean up the system and let's uh, simply uh, turn each country's, uh, link each country's contribution to a fixed percentage of their, let's say, gross national income or gross domestic product, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you know, some acceptable metric which for which we have data for all member countries, right? So, in our proposal, uh, just to, to to give you an example, we say let's uh, make assessed contributions to be 0.1 percent of a country's uh, gross domestic product, right? Just it's an example, 0.1 percent. Um, every country contributes 0.1%. The United States, Japan, uh, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Ghana, and, and, and other smaller countries. Um, two things here. Uh, we, use, we chose 0.1% of G GDP because it is a relatively small amount of money in the general scheme of things, right? I mean, countries... Uh, across the world, according to the IMF, are spending 6.3% of GDP on average of subsidizing energy, right? In other words, uh, 63 times more goes to fund the uh, consumption of gasoline, uh, natural gas, electricity, carbon, which of course is very destructive, right? It, it accelerates climate change. It's very regressive because the benefits largely go to the middle classes, you know, the people who have big houses and, and, and drive uh, cars in the cities. It doesn't, those funds don't go to the illiterate Indian uh, women villagers, you know, living a hundred kilometers from Delhi who are subsisting on, on agriculture, right? So, um, 0.1% 0, 0 of GDP is, is something that is accessible that would not uh, destabilize the budget of you know, countries, even poor countries. Uh, but given the scale of the global economy, um, GDP in 2021, which is the latest year for which we have data, um, in, in a couple of months, the 2022 data will be published, but but it's not going to be dramatically different from 2021 data. In 2021, global GDP 
was $105 trillion, right? So if every UN member contributes 0.1% of their gross national income or gross domestic product, the figures are broadly, broadly the same, this generates $105 billion, you know, that would uh, fill in the coffers of the United Nations, which, just to continue with the examples, is actually several times larger than the current U UN budget, even if you include peacekeeping operations, even if you include uh, earmark contributions. So here we're talking about real money, real money, you know, for the first time, right? Where money that can that can fund the, help the poor countries fund the transition to to renewable energy economy and so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes people have asked, but you know, is this fair? I mean, yes, you're you're asking every country to make a contribution of 0.1 percent of GDP, but but you know, obviously, a country like uh, Germany or Japan or the United States has a capacity to to pay. Uh, uh, you know, that is, you know, much stronger than countries that are facing all kinds of needs, poverty, and, and, and so on. And our answer to that is that, again, let's, let's think of the $105 billion, right? Who are going to be the primary beneficiaries, you know, or who are in fact now, but would be in the future as well, the primary beneficiaries of UN funding? It's not Germany and Sweden, right? The, the bulk of the UN funding goes, goes to the developing world. So if Ghana contributes 0.1% of its uh, GNP to the UN budget as an obligation of UN membership, you can be absolutely sure that through various UN programs, uh, through the various initiatives uh, in the area of education, infrastructure, public health, uh, climate change mitigation, and so on, Ghana is going to recoup much more than 0.1% of its uh, uh, GDP in the, in, 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 the, in the year in which the contribution is made. In other words, the money comes in and then it's redistributed and the, the, the low-income countries will, will be net beneficiaries of, of the funding and will receive far more than they contribute. So we will live in a world in which we have net contributors, the wealthy countries, and net recipients, the, the poorer countries, but everybody as an obligation contributes 0.1% of GDP. And this adds clarity, it adds transparency, it adds, it cleans up the system, which at the moment is, is really very, very non-transparent, at times corrupt, uh, uh, you know, amenable to abuse uh, by, by some of the larger countries, and, and, and just creates discomfort. And, 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 and to add insult to injury, it doesn't even deliver uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, enough resources for the for the UN, which literally, I have friends at the UN. Uh, I, I uh, a couple of years ago, I met with uh, one of the under secretary generals uh, of the UN, and uh, I was giving him a copy of the Global Governance book, and he had invited me to visit him in UN headquarters, and he confided to me that look, this month we we we're having difficulties meeting our electricity bill, right? Uh, you know, we have fund we have funds to pay salaries, and and we're we're having to sort of re reallocate resources so that so that the electricity should not shut down in UN headquarters, which to me, you know, is really quite quite shocking, quite extraordinary, right? So that's one one aspect. But in the book, we also go beyond, and we say, look, you know, we need to think about how generate how to generate uh, additional resources. Um, just for the broader agenda of uh, not just the UN, but you know the other things that that uh, have to do with the future of the planet, right? So let me give you an example. Right. And Arthur, okay. let me just cut in to say we have about fifteen more minutes or so left for the session. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll I'll stop in a couple of minutes. Sure. So so we in in the book, as you will see, we introduce a whole range of of uh, uh, proposals to generate additional funding that can be allocated either to the UN directly and its agencies or to things like, for instance, uh, you know, financing the transition to, to a renewable energy economy, which is going to cost trillions and trillions of dollars in the next 10, 15 years, right? Um, so here we, we talk and we have a, a fairly detailed section on attacks on financial transactions. It's an idea that was inspired by James Tobin some, some you know, 50 years ago 
but it has evolved and, and now is a tax not on foreign exchange uh, buying and selling, but on financial transactions. And this potentially can, can generate vast resources because the financial markets are very large, very deep, and, and are, you know, there's an enormous amount of turnover trading on a daily basis, right? So that could be a potential, potential source of great funding. Uh, we also, um, uh, more recently, not in the book, but more recently, I have been uh, making presentations, and I'm, like, I'm actually author. I am the author of a paper that is going to be published in a in a Oxford University Press compendium on the IMF. We I am proposing a more active use of the special drawing right, the SDR, the composite currency of the IMF, as a as a source of funding, you know, for development. Because the IMF actually is able to uh, produce international liquidity. It's the only international organization that we have that actually creates money and has done so a few times in the past. And then, and then in the chapter to conclude, there is also a fairly detailed discussion of the, what we call the peace dividend. You know, in other words, um, we, we live in a world in which there is no system of collective security in which there are many unmet needs and and uh, you know to to be able to manage our finances in a better way to create a system of collective security which allows us to redirect the resources that are now going to the military to the propping up of military establishments to defense and and warfare you know could go could go could be reallocated to to education to public health to infrastructure to climate change mitigation it could have a huge development impact that that uh, uh, you know would would enhance human welfare in 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 in, in multiple ways um uh, let me see i'm looking at my notes and i i think i've i've oh yes you know one proposal that we put on the table which which i think is is uh, uh, I, I feel very confident that this is something that could be done. You know, at the moment, the IMF, the, the, the UN doesn't have a, a an independent source of funding, right? These assessed contributions are negotiated, you know, sort of haggle over, I should say, every three years, right? So the current system where China's contribution has gone to 15%, I think is for the years 2022, 23, 24, right? Uh, it doesn't have a separate independent source of funding. The European Union does. The European Union has depoliticized the funding of its European uh, supranational institutions. I don't know whether you know, but you know, next time you go to a member of the European country and you go to a restaurant and you order your, your meal, uh, uh, you will see that in your, in your receipt, uh, there is something called a VAT, VAT tax, right? It's a value-added tax. Uh, it's assessed automatically. A fixed percentage of the of the value added tax that you pay for your meal in Madrid or in Barcelona or in Vienna goes directly to the UN budget. A fixed percentage of the import duties that are paid by companies that import import you know machinery from Japan or from China into Germany or France goes directly to the to the European Union budget. And so they have this this flood of money that comes in automatically, the government ha has no way to change that. It is embedded in the European Union law, right? The, the Spanish government may disapprove of the policies of the European Union. It cannot stop the flow of BAT contributions and other, other independent sources funded directly to the UN budget. And this allows the European Union to plan. They don't do budget annually. They do budget every six years because they know the, the money is going to flow in regardless. And, and this has empowered institutions and allows strategic planning. It, it just is, 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 is a very efficient way of funding a supranational organization. We think that longer term, the UN should have that. You, know? uh, you don't have to develop a separate tax authority for the United Nations in its 130 member 93 member countries. No, every country collects the taxes, but they allocate a percentage of that directly to the UN budget. Uh, short of that is the 0.1% of G GDP formula, which is, which is, you know, in the short term, uh, simpler. But I'll stop here. Okay, thank you so much, Augusto. Uh, I'll take hands and uh, put them up if you got them, and if you got questions, and I'll start with David. Augusto, what would be your, your reaction to a system that would uh, have a user tax on the common areas of the planet? 
uh, that way it would um, uh, get rid of the assessment to the nations or it could be a supplement to the nations, but you would uh, tax the exploration and use of the atmosphere. So anytime people would take an international flight, that would be taxed. Also on the oceans, on the great wealth of the oceans, on exploration of Antarctica and the moon. So the common areas of the planet are those that are not owned by any particular country. And that could be a source for the world. Okay. Thank you, David. Augusto, did you want to hear all the que questions first or do you want to answer them individually? In individually, just, just uh, so, yeah, I think okay, we have then a go quick, ahead. Quick, quick turnover. Sure, I'm go very ahead. sympathetic, uh, David, I'm very sympathetic to those ideas. And in fact, we hint at some of them in the, in, in, in the chapter. Um, you know, we need to be creative. We need to be innovative about tapping into resources. You know, the IMF says that we lose every year $600 billion of, of uh, uh, corporate tax revenue um, because of, uh, you know, uh, sort of loopholes and uh, uh, abuse of the tax system by corporations who relocate to low ta lower tax environments and, and, and so on. And, and, and so, um, yes, you know, we, we, and of course, corruption itself, you know, later, as you know, chapter 18 uh, deals with the whole question of corruption. And there we, we talk about, you know, the need to plug some of these leakages that come as a result of misuse of resources. So absolutely, I, 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 I think your idea is excellent. I think we should do something along those lines together with many other things. There is no shortage of money in the world. There is no shortage of resources, you know. What happens with the tax on financial transactions, now called the Robin Hood tax, which has been endorsed by a thousand economists in the world, is that whenever it's put on the table, you know, the bankers who in their pockets own the senators and the congressmen immediately, you know, move on, move on and they, they, they lobby and they, they terrorize the politicians and they coerce the politicians not to approve this kind of thing. But that's sh a short term, you know, because in the end we all suffer and, you know, climate change is going to hit everybody, including the rich bankers who oppose the, the, this tax. Thank you, Augusto. Carla May, why don't you go next? In, in our discussions, uh, as I've been listening, uh, we are very much oriented toward objective change. And I am going to just pose that there is a missing piece in our considerations. And that is the common resource that we have as peoples and as cultures is the use of our human consciousness. We do not monitor our consciousness. We do not, we have not yet addressed interiority analysis. We do objective work, but our interiority analysis does not, is not complicated. It can be taught to a fifth grader. It has four steps. We gather data. We ask questions about the meaning of that data. We reach conclusions about that data, and then we decide what to do about that data. Those four steps can be absolutely crippled by the second step, which is the meaning of the data given to us because it is riddled with bias. And bias in its turn takes four forms. This does not take a, a PhD. The four forms of bias are what we call individual egoism, my way or the highway. Think of the news reports that you have recently heard. The second form is group bias. No, we will not educate our women. And third, the general bias of don't ask questions, which also applies to stunting the intelligences of the female in Afghanistan. And the fourth is simply by the careful observance, we watch for the dramatic bias of the, of the trauma that a certain people or a certain culture has gone through. If we do not know those biases, they will play a, a, a dance on us and they will cripple the middle movement of interiority analysis, which is monitoring our own conscious functions. No one escapes this. Chinese, 
Japanese, American, Afghanistan. No one escapes the working of their human consciousness. It is time for us to begin to do interiority analysis as well as objective analysis. Okay. Thank you, Carla May. Augusto, do you want to speak to that? Um, I'm not sure that, that uh, uh, it's a question. I think it's a, a reflection on the part of Carla, which, which I think is, is very profound and very welcome. I share your concern for, for, for women, discrimination uh, against women, uh, not just in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at the World Bank, we build up a database over the last uh, decade or so uh, under, under my direction, as it happens, where we, um, for 190 countries, we made a listing of all the multiple forms of discrimination against women embedded in the laws of countries, the civil code, the, the, the constitution, the tax code, labor code, and so on. And that database allows me, for instance, to say in Iran, there are 24 different ways in which the Iranian law uh, turns women into second class citizens. So uh, to the extent that your comments address this issue of the mistreatment and discrimination against women, I, I am fully sympathetic and, 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 and supportive of what you said. Great, thank you, Augusta. Um, so, um, uh, Simon, let me get you in, and then, and again, I'm going to ask everyone to be brief. We we have less than five minutes, so uh, and, Simon, and I, if, I, uh, I need to I need to exit at 1:29 because uh, oh. I have to move on to another hall where I'm I'm speaking. <laughs> so, so apologies for that. Okay, no problem. So we have less than three minutes. So, Simon, if you can get it in quickly. Right. Um, how does the European Union manage things, and can its system be extended to the world union? My question to you, Augusto. Um, very good question. Look, the European Union has done this because they have the political will. They have built up the institutions um, that, that uh, uh, make this, this feasible. They have embedded in European Union law this system of funding, you know, which has depoliticized the process of funding and has given European Union institutions access to these resources, you know, in a, in a kind of reliable, predict, predictable way. But in principle, there's no reason why we couldn't do something like that on a, on a global scale. There is no reason why we couldn't uh, sort of follow in the spirit of David's uh, proposals, you know, of global taxes, the beneficiary of which is the is the UN system in, 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 some, in some way, you know? Um, I, I think that uh, um, this, well, first of all, the European Union will, will add members in the next decade and, and two. Um, so this, 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 this system will, will expand. And uh, there is no reason why something along those lines could not be replicated in other, in other parts of the world uh, as, as you know, integration continues, as you know, new regional groupings emerge a little bit in the spirit of the European Union. Uh, the reason I mention the European Union is because, because it suggests that with political will and creativity, you know, we can empower our system of multilateral institutions. You know, we don't do it with the UN at the moment, unfortunately, but we can, and other countries are doing it. In, in the event that somebody would tell you, no, that cannot be done, that's utopian. You know? Um, with great apologies for disconnecting, Bob, um, as I said, um, I was happy that I was able to join you at least for, sure. this, for this half an hour. I very much look forward to our event in May, at which time I can confirm my participation in my calendar. I don't have anything uh, 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 that would interfere. So we'll see you soon. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us to the degree that you could. OK, okay thank, you. thank you. I'll hold my question for next time. All right. Great. Thank you. So at, at this point then, um, get, given the time, I'd like to make the transition to see if there are any announcements from the group about events or things that you're promoting. Um, so now is the time again, make it brief because we, we have run out of time. So David, I see your hand first. Uh, before the next book club, the St. Louis chapter of Citizens for Global Solutions will have its annual meeting on Zoom and all of you are invited to attend. Uh, Larry Whitner of the National Board will speak on how a world federation can eliminate nuclear weapons. And if you would like to join that discussion on Sunday, May the 7th at 2 p.m. Central Time, simply email me and I'll send you the um, 
the Zoom address and the passcode. Um, my email address is my last name, Auten at hotmail.com. So that's May 7th, Sunday, 2 p.m. Central. Terrific. Thank you so much. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, I'll then turn to Gail um, to confirm our next meeting date and any other logistics we need to do to wrap up. So, Gail, do you have the date for it for us? Yeah, we got an echo. Do you have two, two things going? Your computer and your phone? No. Okay, it's okay now. Um, yes, yeah, so um, our next meeting will be Saturday, May 13. It's the second Sunday of the month, which fits our pattern. Second Saturday of the month. Pardon? You said Sunday, second oh, Saturday. I, I thought I said Saturday. Second okay. Saturday of the month okay. from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And we will be focusing on part three, that's chapters 13 through 17, pages 293 to 388, governance and the management of multiple global risks. So um, you can put that on your calendar and of course I'll send you a message. So um, uh, you can watch for that. I'll send it this afternoon. Great, thank you, Gail. And I want to invite people if they want to see this again or any part of it again, Oh, uh, author, I see your finger. Yeah. Could you say something in a sentence? In one sentence? Uh, Mr. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Getting, uh, in I, uh, I do have an announcement that uh, uh, my dear Benjamin, who's one of the foremost uh, peace leaders and talking about her new book on Ukraine on our People Powered Planet podcast uh, this Wednesday, 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern. So uh, we want to invite everybody to come this, that week, this week and every week to the People Powered Planet a podcast where we deal with many of these key ideas that uh, uh, that, you're, that you're dealing with in uh, in the book club. Great, thank thank, thank you. you so much. Thank thank you, author. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. We'll see you next month, and uh, have a great month in between. Take thank care now. I invite um, our thank production team to stay thank on you. for a moment. Thank you, everyone.